Yeah, I'm, I'm Andy. You guys know me. I know, I know most of your guys' faces. So um, I'm glad to be home. I, Rachel is at home today. She, her cousin came up and visited. So they had like a little ladies weekend. And I figured, you know, I probably didn't want to paint my nails and, and toenails or watch, you know, rom-coms all weekend. So I decided I'd come up and visit with my dad while they have their little, uh, their time together to give bubble tea and Starbucks and making cupcakes, <laughs> all sorts of fun things. But anyway, uh, so I decided to come up and see mom and dad having a hopefully a good meeting tomorrow. So um, things are happening at Purdue University and God is at the center of them. It's been really exciting uh, this semester um, to see. So if, uh, if you're not familiar, I, I work with university uh, students at Purdue University and help teach them about Jesus, uh, help them see themselves as uh, not just followers of Jesus, but disciples of Jesus that can make disciples. And so um, last year we had a really excellent core of freshmen that were hungry and passionate about Jesus. And this year we said, this is the first year ever, that we empowered or equipped, equipped and empowered um, sophomores to lead our missional community groups and our discipleship groups. And um, we really have a conviction in, in our hearts that anybody can make a disciple and hopefully we're all making disciples unto Jesus but we can all make disciples unto something that, by how we live our life and how we um, uh, teach others through what we do and so sometimes, sometimes that's like it's like a scary thought so I want to make sure that I'm um, always discipling somebody unto Jesus instead of some other you know way or method that, that I have but um so these sophomores now are discipling new, a new freshman class. And last night we, no, it's Sunday now. So Friday night we baptized nine students. It was awesome to hear testimonies of how God has wrecked people's lives and, and, and rebuilt it in Jesus. It's been amazing. Um, one, of, one of the guys, he grew up in a very um, strict Christian home. And, um, you know, he, he told a story that when he was younger, um, he would, his father would, they would go to like a restaurant or something, and he, his father would say, Michael, would you like to pray for the meal? And they're in public, he was like, no way, I couldn't do that. And so his father would always say, what, are you ashamed of Jesus? And, and Michael kind of confessed to everybody on Friday night, he was like, yeah, I totally was. And I was, I just, I, I was ashamed to, to say I was a Jesus follower. And then he's like, but now we um, we do our water baptisms. I know, I think you guys have a little water trough that trough, uh, water trough that you guys use, and we do them in the public pool at Purdue University. So we have this aqua big aquatic center, a big Olympic pool in there. There's huge diving boards right above us, and then they have this little spa in the corner. And so we do our water baptisms right there in the spa. Uh, we have them, you know, turn off the jets or whatever. We get in, do our little baptism of communion. Um, but as a Previously, uh, for, for previous years, they've always had the correct for the pool has been closed, so we would come at nine o'clock when they're closed. But this year was the first year that the um, that it was still open, so there was like people swimming in the Olympic pool, and you know, right next to us, and we're doing our water baptism. We had the lifeguards everywhere, and so um, so he was. Mike would have said, you know, I used to be ashamed of Jesus, but now I, I'm not ashamed, and I want to die right here in front of everybody and be raised to life in Jesus. And so it's just a really, just a really exciting time where he was telling other stories. I used to be ashamed just to pray over my food, but now he goes out on campus and he has testimonies of him going and just praying for people on campus, seeing healings. Um, and so it's just, it's exciting that God is doing, doing new things and trans. It's, it's. When I say wrecking people's life, he's transforming their lives from, from a life that was centered on self to a life that's centered on Jesus, where they're willing to die for whatever Jesus would have them to do. And um, it's, it's, it's getting more and more exciting. Every week there's new testimonies. Um, we've been praying that our group would become uh, uh, more aware of the unbelievers around them. And so we've been praying this and kind of teaching on it all semester long. And last Tuesday we had a prayer meeting had about 40, yeah, about 40 students come out on a Tuesday evening for prayer, and it was pretty awesome. And then we opened with like what we call body life, and when we have.
have body life. We just want to tell each other encouraging stories of what God has done over the last week. And so we had eight different people tell stories. Of, it was really neat. It wasn't just um, students that had made decisions that, hey, I'm going to share my faith with my Friday night class. But there were three or four um, stories of how uh, people came to them asking them what, what they believed. And it was just like, okay, God, you're just drawing people to yourself. It's cool. We'll be a, we'll be a vessel used to share Jesus, to share his glory on campus. You just keep on drawing people. Um, yeah. And then a little update um, for some of you that get my newsletter, they see they're hanging up um, on the bulletin board out there. But uh, you, you guys may know my friend Hao. Um, Hao was a Chinese believer two, well, two years ago he came to the U.S., and had never heard the name of Jesus before. And he had been in the U.S. for two weeks when he got an invitation to our fall retreat. And he was there at the fall retreat and um, reading the book of Colossians, but that was what the sermon was about. And he had some questions afterwards. He asked me, who's Paul? Because um, I said, Paul, the apostle of Jesus, wrote the letter. And then he said, and his servant Timothy. So he asked me who Timothy was. And his third question was, what's the gospel? I was like, Oh God, are you going to make it this easy to present the gospel to them? <laughs> and he uh, he receives Jesus that evening and says, "I want to I want to be forgiven. I want to live for Jesus." And so I walked with him for two two years, discipling. <clears throat> when he left on August thirty first, he said, "Andrew, I can't wait to tell you about the first person that I tell um, about Jesus when I return to China." And last night I got to talk to him. For the, he's um, finishing up his PhD, so he didn't want to. Uh, he didn't want to talk to me until he had some kind of good thing to tell me because he, he told me last night, he said, I didn't want to share my bad emotions with you because he's, you know, he's like tirelessly, tirelessly working on his PhD to get it finished. And um, I said, no, that's not a friend is for. I'm, I'm here. I want to encourage you and lift you up and even if you have some bad emotions. But anyway, um, so I got to talk to him last night and he was encouraged. It's like, you know, I don't know the direction for my life. But I keep on reading the Bible so because I know that there's answers there. And I was just like, oh, it made my heart really excited that, um, you know, sometimes when you're doing university ministry and people leave the university, you never hear, hear from them again, or maybe they fall away from the Lord when they're not, you know, connected with you. But it was just exciting to hear him talk about Jesus um, and the conversations he's had with them since returning to China. That's a little up thing. There, there's... I think those are my newest newsletters out there, if I, if I see the pictures correctly, so you guys can see some other things. Um, another thing I just wanted to open, open or tell about before I get into the, the word this morning is how God has been showing Rachel and I that he's totally in control of all situations. And so I, I was, while I was worshiping, I was just thinking about these stories and I wasn't planning to talk about them because I think I have uh, something that God laid on my heart for this morning from the Word. Um, but I thought maybe somebody needs encouragement this morning, so I'll share share them. But um, earlier this year, you guys I may know Rachel, my my wife, um, is uh, has um, health issues that causes her um, intestines to spontaneously bleed every once in a while, and uh, she has some internal bleeding issues. And so in in May, I was in Nicaragua, and Rachel had mentioned right before there, we got no insurance, so she's like, hey, I want to I want to go to the doctor while you're gone, and, and I have these new, new doctor's appointments. And I, I immediately, I said, I, I like knew in my spirit, I was like, no, I don't, I, I don't want you to go. Like, that was like the, my gut reaction. I was like, no, don't go while I'm gone. Um, because I, I just felt like they were going to find out that she was bleeding again. Like, I just, like, in my spirit, I just had that witness. And at the, at the this, you know, all happened like a millisecond. I don't know if you guys have a conversation with God sometimes, and it's like one second, one second, but it's like a long conversation, you know. But so I have this feeling, I have this thought, okay, she shouldn't do this, and then uh, while I'm gone, you know, especially, and then she, uh, but then the, the Lord says to me, uh, Andrew, do you trust me? And I, yes, yes, I, I do trust you. Um, I trust you. Okay, and he said, don't say anything. So then, um, two days later, she says, hey, Andrew, I, I'm getting a new doctor, and so they want to do some blood work. And, and again, like, in my spirit, I was like, no, they're not. I'm like, they're going to find out.
and that's something and I was like, I wanted to tell her, no, wait till after I return to, to get the blood work done. And, um, and again, the, the Lord said to me, Andrew, do you trust me? And I, of course, I was, yes, I mean, I, I do trust you. But I, I mean, I don't want this to happen while I'm gone. You know, maybe I should be here and I would be able to take care of her. I can, you know, be in control of the situation somehow. And, um, and he just said, Andrew, do you trust me? And I said, well, I trust you. So uh, sure enough, I'm, I'm in Nicaragua and I'm on a bus with some college students from Purdue and we're heading to a teaching um, session that I was going to be leading for some university leaders, teaching them how to, um, how to disciple their university students some global pastors were coming, and I get the text message on the 21st of, um, of May, Andrew, I am going to the emergency room. And I said, oh, what's going on? You know, and I'm able to, I actually had better cell service in Nicaragua than I did in the end of the <laughs> And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to call. And I, I called Rachel, and sure enough, they had done the blood work, and I don't know how many, you know, term medical terminology, but her hemoglobin, um, basically uh, the red blood cells in her body, um, normally people's levels are between 13 and 16. Uh, the amount of units in your body, well, um, when they did her blood work, they found that her, her unit was down to five. So this is, this is a severe anemic situation, and which normally requires at least two to three blood transfusions for her, her levels to get up to where it needs to be. And so I, I don't know, I text message mom and dad, um, I was like, hey, um, I don't know what to do, and uh, mom and dad were able to come, come down, our, our pastor that was there locally came to the hospital, took Rachel to the hospital, and I'm there in Nicaragua feeling completely helpless, you know, something like that happens, you're a thousand miles away, there's no, I, I don't have the money but to rearrange my plane tickets to come back, it was completely a, uh, a situation where where it was, God asked me, Andrew, do you trust me? And so, you know, with all of this going on, knowing knowing that, that, that God is my healer, that, that God is my king, that he's in control of all things, that nothing happens without his, without his permission, he is in control of all things, he's sovereign, right? And I'm on the bus, and I'm just totally, like, floored. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I know what you said that I would, I, do I trust you? But I never, like, okay, I did. I, okay, God, I really didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, and so I just, we, we together, the team prayed. And um, so everything worked out actually really well where she, they released her that evening. They gave her one transfusion. We didn't know at the time that it was because she had went to the wrong um, hospital for her insurance. So um, that's why they released her that evening because they wouldn't, that she, couldn't stay as an inpatient at the hospital. Normally it's a four, at least a four or five day stay in the hospital. And so, of course, the medical bills would crack up because it was out of network hospital. Uh, they released her that evening and just said, you know, take iron pills and go see your, your regular doctor. Um, and so then when, when I came home and I did find out it was out of, out of network, then I was like, that bill is going to be crazy. And I was like, next thought, like, and I said, right now we have, you know, maybe a thousand dollars in our bank account, you know, living as missionaries, we just live off of what people um, give to us. And I said, there's no way that we're going to be able to pay for this. And um, sure enough, about, you know, three, four weeks down the road after more um, hospital visits and more tests, and uh, we ended up getting a bill for like nine thousand dollars. That after the insurance covered, like nine thousand dollars we had to pay, and I said, "God, there's like there's no way that we can do this at all." And and again, I just hear this voice, "Andrew, do you trust me?" And I'm like, "Yeah." I mean, like, I I mean, I don't know even even know where I can't. It's not even you know, with as being a missionary, it's not even possible for me to get a job to help me pay off this kind of thing. Or like, it's there's not like I. Uh, I, 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 love, I like to live I like to live by faith, but I don't like yeah. calling people. I don't like calling churches up and saying, "Hey, um, I have a medical bill. Will you help? Will, will you let me speak so that you can give me an offering so I can pay for my bill?" Like I, I, I didn't want it to go around that way, but I, but I was like, "Hey, God, 
I trust you, you keep on asking me if I trust you, God, I trust you that you're going to make a way. Some, somehow this is possible. Um, so we, I don't know, I wasn't even planning to talk about all this, but I, I guess somebody needs to hear this, so I'm going to continue talking about it. But, uh, so we, we take some time and um, end up month down the road, we're making like, you know, $100 on this payment, or on this thing, like, okay, we'll chip away, we'll have this for like five years, we're chipping away this $100 at a time, <laughs> and $100 a month at a time, and um, we get this letter, eventually we get this letter from the hospital saying, hey, you, know, you, you haven't paid your bill yet, you know, <laughs> we want our money, <laughs> kind of thing, we're like, well, we don't have your money at all, and so uh, Rachel writes a letter and says, hey, would you have mercy on us? A little while longer, we get a, a letter back from them that said, "Okay, we'll pay four thousand dollars for your bill." It's like awesome. <laughs> like, that's really cool, God. We, we weren't expecting that at all, and so you know, that's leave us, you know, four thousand dollars. And um, so then we were like, "Okay, well, we do have a thousand dollars in savings. We'll just pay all that off." So we did that, and um, so now our bill is lowering a little bit here and there. Um, so then. Fast forward, we're, we're trying to get payments, we're eating things. Well, then, um, just as recently as 30 weeks ago, we were still faced with you know, a few thousand dollars left on the on the bill, and we get a another letter in the mail. We had we had only we had only sent one letter, so they, it was really weird. I, I, I've never been through this situation before. Like, there's a hospital, there's a bill that we got from the actual hospital of her stay there, and then there's another bill that we got from the doctors, um, and so they were almost equal. Um, but anyway, so the, the hospital bill, that was the one that they forgave $4,000 of. Yes. But the other one, we never, I, it took us, I guess in my ignorance, uh, it took me a while to figure out that there were actually two different bills and two different people that were sending us. So out of nowhere, we get a, a, a letter about a month ago that said, hey, um, we're going to forgive, or forgive 80% of the, the remainder of the bill. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay, God, you are, you've already control. I can trust you, right? Right. So then, um, two, two, two and a half weeks. So if you guys are on my Facebook, uh, our Facebook group, you might have seen this, but um, we were at a fall, uh, fall retreat this year, and um, got an opportunity to speak to 400 students. It was awesome, and um, God was moving and did did a lot of things in people's heart. Uh, there was a, a guy in our Purdue group that had been with and witnessing to for a year. He'd been part of our missional communities. And after a whole year of just people loving on him, he finally made a decision to follow Jesus. It's awesome. Thanks, Brandon. I mean, it's just like, we're lots of really cool reports. People being filled with that Holy Spirit. And then um, on the way home that Sunday, uh, we're driving, and there was like, there was tons of traffic and things like that. But we were coming coming over the hill, uh, over this hill, and there's a police officer on the right hand side, so everybody was, you know, you see the cop, you break and you stop, you know. And then when there's all that traffic, then people like come almost to a complete stop in that kind of situation. And uh, I I was driving ahead of Rachel and I had um, hit, hit the brakes and I came about a, a foot to the car that was in front of me. I was like, oh man, that's pretty good that. And so um, a few minutes go by and I make this phone call from Rachel. He's all in her eyes out, and she um, had just came over the hill, and the same thing happened. Somebody stopped in front of her, and she ended up hitting me, hitting the car in front of her. Air black, air, both of the airbags deployed. The front car, you know, you know uh, what do you call it? Accordion and just, just crunched, and um, wow, it was terrible. So I and so she's like, yeah, you know, you need to come back. She was just freaking out. So you know, I'm able to turn around and come back and. I get there and the police officer said, I, out of, I mean, I, he goes, I've approached accidents like this many, many times before. It is a miracle that both Rachel and the two passengers that she had in the car, they went, they, they were walking with, with almost no, they had a few bruises. She had a bruise on her hand from the airbags, but other than that, there was, she was perfectly fine. She went to the doctor, checked out, no broken bones, no um, puncture, anything. It was just perfect. And, and then again, the same voice that I had heard multiple times over the year, Andrew, do you trust me? I was like, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I have 
to trust you. You know, again, God showing himself that he's trustworthy to me, that he's in control of all situations. I said, okay, well now, uh, you know, we paid off the, the medical bills and, and I think, but, or paying, paying off the medical bills, but uh, we don't have enough money to buy another car. Like I have, I have a little car I took up here and um, Rachel works at a daycare, so she has a completely different schedule, a completely different location than where, I, where I'm at. And, um, and I said, okay, I have no idea how we're gonna purchase a car. So we get a, anyway, we get a phone call on Tuesday, and uh, they said, ah, would, you, would you like a new car? And we're like, well, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> of course we want a new car. I got, I got you know, a few hundred dollars in the bank, maybe. I mean, I, there's no way we can afford you know, a new car. And um, I said, no, um, I want to buy you a new car. And we're like, God, this is, this is ridiculous. What? <laughs> And uh, we, we both, like, uh, after, the, after the conversation, we looked, Rachel and I looked at each other and we were like, like is, this, uh, like, is this really happening? Like, we're, like, pinching ourselves, like, like, are you, for real, we, give, we spent some time in prayer, like, okay, is this, is this, is this really you, God, or is this somebody, is this something else going on? It's like, again, just, again, just so clearly, Andrew, do you trust me? And so, um, the next day, they, they called us back and they said, uh, we picked out a 2008 Honda Civic Hybrid with 50,000 miles on it. Would you like this car? <laughs> we said, yeah. Like, there's no way we could get a car. Like, like no. We said, no strings attached. Like, we we don't have any money to, to do this. And um, so the weekend the weekend after she got she lost her car, we got a brand new twelve thousand dollar. I mean, not brand new. It's 2008, but I mean. It's new to us. I mean, new, newest car we've driven, twelve thousand dollar car, right? Um, like just another avenue of, of God just saying, Andrew, do you trust me? Um, one of the immediate questions my pastor Linda had asked me right after the accident, she came to the accident too. He said, So Andrew, what kind of insurance do you have on the car? I don't know. I mean, cheap insurance, whatever you know, save. Say 15% in 15 minutes or less, you know, like, <laughs> I don't even have a clue what I have on the car. And <laughs> now I do. And I know all the specifics, so next time, you know, but um, I get home and I, you know, look up and I had a collision on the car. I had no idea. I mean, I had 170,000 miles on this car. I mean, it's not worth much. <laughs> and it was, it still had. It's still had, you know, roll, roll down windows, you know, and, and manual locks, you know, no cruise control, um, AM, FM radio, you know, it's, just, it's not, a, not a great car, or not a pricey car. And so, um, but we had a collision on it, and I was like, okay, well, cool, maybe we'll get $1,000 from the insurance company. That would be, that'd be a blessing, we could pay off some of the medical bills. Well, um, I, I don't know what kind of adjuster they had to come look at our car, but he loved our car. <laughs> I mean, this is the only question. Like, like if you go and look at my blue, the, the blue Nissan out there, it has hail damage on it. So last, um, earlier this August, this July, there was a hail storm that went through um, West Lafayette, like, like quarter size hail. I mean, in my car is completely, you can see all the dents everywhere. In her car too, I mean, there was, I know where the dents are on the car. And he rated the car, the paint and everything, the body work on the car, as perfect dealer, dealer rating. I'm like, I don't know what car he was looking at. Like, I know what that car looked like. And I mean, he gave us good credit for the interior, for the windows. I mean, like everything good that you could rate about a car. Our car was rated good. And I'm like, I'm, I can point to all the different things that were wrong with the car. I mean, even even the the driver's side. A mirror was like hanging off, like we had re glued it back on. Anyway, he like braided it off. And so we, he gave us an estimate. It was like three times the amount that I was expecting to, to get. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And, you know, again, Andrew, do you trust me? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> I mean, obviously, every time you say this, something, well, it's something. Hard happened, and also something you know miraculous. 
So we, we did this check and we're able to pay off all of all of the medical bills. So we had the last Monday I made like four different phone calls and I have this, now we have a zero balance of all of the things. And to even a greater awesomeness of God, our savings account is now greater than what it was before we had uh, before Rachel had went to the hospital in May. But 
and here's Jesus, and um, they, there's this crowd of people that's with them. And, um, you know, the day's getting long, they're, they're needing some food. And so, um, he says, in verse 5, he says, Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. And he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Verse 6, he says, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. He asked him the question to test him because he already knew the miracle that he was going to perform. I just read that. I didn't even read that earlier this morning. It just hit me. He already knew. He, Jesus, Jesus is sovereignty. Jesus, he's all knowing in all situations. So he already knew the miracle that he was going to perform before he asked the test. That just gives me some encouragement about everything I just told you. He already, he already, he already knew the miracle that he was going to perform. We can hold on to faith. All right. So um, in verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have people sit. There's plenty of, there's plenty of grass in the place, and they sat down. There's about 5,000 men that were there. And verse 4 says, when they had all had enough, oh, sorry, verse 11, Jesus took the, the loaves, gave things, distributed them to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to, be, to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that were left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. This is a crazy, crazy um, miracle that happens. Jesus takes five five loaves and two fish and he feeds a, a crowd of uh, five thousand. And um, we, we can, if you continue with the story, um, you can even read the headings here. It's kind of nice. They have little headings. You know, if this was in Greek, we would have all these headings and punctuations and everything, but um, kind of nice for us in modern translations to have them. But we see the, the story of Jesus walking on the water. He sends his disciples out, and he goes up to pray, and then he goes and meets them on the water, and you have that um, awesome um, experience there. But then Jesus goes back into this teaching mode, and in this teaching mode, he, has, he makes some great points. Uh, some awesome challenging points. And so I want to encourage you because we won't. It would take, you know, like I said, there's 71 verses here. So there's there's a lot to, to take and meditate and, and eat. So I want to challenge you guys this week to, to take and meditate and eat and, and, and consume some of these verses and, and pray prayer over them. But but you see, one of the things that he um, that Jesus begins to challenge the disciples, when he begins to teach them, he says this in verse 26. He says, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. That's something that I get to teach um, international students when I'm teaching them the Bible, is that oftentimes the Bible, when we read it, we have the, the, surface, the surface meaning, so you can take the, the words, and have, they have literal meaning and literal instruction that Jesus that is giving to people. But then there's oftentimes Jesus is known to be speaking in parable. So the parable it has a, a literal surface meaning that um, that gives instruction. And then there's all oftentimes in Jesus' words a deeper spiritual meaning or application to the, the points that he's making. So when I look at this in verse 26, he says, you are looking for me, but not because you have seen the signs I have performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. So in one, in, in one instance, we can look at this um, and say, you, you, you are looking for me not because of the signs that I saw, but because you ate the loaves. So we can say, okay, they just ate all the loaves and, and the fishes that they, um, they just had. So they had some physical 
physical food. So their belly was literally physically full. Okay, so that's one way we can we can say, and that's that's a very um, valid way to take the scripture because they they had just seen it. But because we know Jesus and he speaks in par parables and he has often deeper meanings, we we can look even beyond just the physical thing, the miracle that took place that that fed their bellies, and say, okay, Jesus, are you trying to are you trying to say something more here? Are there are you trying to say something deeper here? So let's read on. This is verse twenty-seven. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 28. Then they asked Jesus, What must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, The works of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. They are asking again, What is the sign then that you'll give us that we may see you and believe in you? That's really like really puzzling to me as I was reading it again. That they had just seen this amazing, actually two amazing signs. If you think about it, they just got the the bread was multiplied and the fish they just got filled, and then he walks on water. That's another crazy sign. I mean, who else can walk on water other than Jesus himself? And they're asking here again. Um, what sign? Give us a sign. You know, when Moses, give us another sign. Give us another miracle. When, when Moses, um, they, they, sorry, 31 it says this, that our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're, they're referring back to the Israelites and saying, you know, the Israelites, they got lots of signs. Moses was like, um, splitting the Red Sea, his stick was turning, you know, into snakes. There was bread that was coming. There was plenty of miracles. When leprosy came and he held up his stick, there were like all these signs, all these miracles. And they said, you know, we had signs before. Give us another sign now. And I'm like, disciples, are you guys have like dementia? Like you guys are like, are you guys forgetting what's going on? I'm like, he just fed five thousand people. He has this mega church, this huge group of people that is now following him. Right? And they're still demanding, God, would you give us another sign? And, yeah, sometimes, if, going back to the, the first part, when, when, when God asks me, Andrew, Andrew, do you trust me? When God asks me, do you trust me? How many times do we, do we demand God for another sign? God, do you need another sign? I want to, you know, I know you came through last time, and you came through this time, I mean, I know Rachel came out of the hospital and she recovered quicker than she ever had before. I know the hospital forgave all the bills. I know, um, you know, the insurance. I actually had a collision. Praise the Lord. Um, I know all these things, but God, would you give me, God, would you give me one more sign? I'm, I'm just not sure. How many have been there before, right? I'm just not, not sure if I can believe you. Jesus says in verse 29, he says, the work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. So many times we allow the our circumstances that go around us, even the lies the enemy tells us to convince us that what we know to be true about God is actually unbelievable. And I want him to say, it is unbelievable, he is really awesome. But our but our the request from the Father is that we would believe. Are you willing to believe? So then Jesus goes into something really crazy here, um, especially if especially we knew um, more about the, the Jewish culture and uh, if we studied Le Levitical laws and things like that. Um, he really challenges, I mean, even my understanding, I'm still you know, working through all this passage. But he, Jesus and all these people, they're all following him, they're all excited, but they're still looking for a sign, they're still like, I don't know if it, you guys have been around um, like any kind of uh, any kind of hype environment or something. But something happens, and there's a lot of there's a lot of followers that come just because something something new and something exciting is happening. So this is kind of what's going on right here. And Jesus says this because he because because Jesus really isn't interested in in I'll say it really bold. He's not really interested in fans and followers. Not at all. So he has all these people. They're all asking for signs. They all, they're all, 
but but what he's getting at here is that there's there's a belief that they they really don't have their belief correct. So he makes this crazy statement, and I don't know what I would have done if I was a Jewish man in the crowd when I heard this. Um, but in verse 53, he says, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will rise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and drinks my uh, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who sent, who feeds on me will live because of me. Uh, what a whole cannibalism thing. But um, right before this, when they had asked um, Jesus for a sign, Jesus says, in verse 35, that I am the bread of life. So they said, you know, in Moses' day, we had this sign, they were the bread that came from heaven. You know, now, where is my sign? And Jesus says, I am that bread. I am that. I am that sign. I am the, I am the life substance. So eat of me. Chew on my flesh. We, we had communion after we do baptisms. Um, we participate. We have everybody that gets baptized or participate in the first communion after baptism together. So we did a little, uh, I was the one that was able to, to give them the, the body of Jesus that was broken, the little bread that represents that, and the, the cup that represents his blood. And we partook of that, remembering Jesus' sacrifice. But here Jesus is asking him, I, I am that. I am the one. That we, if, we, if we take this even further, it gives us more light onto what Jesus was saying in verse 26, we said Jesus. In verse 26, he said that there, there is a surface understanding of it, right? That they had just received the physical bread, um, and so their bellies are full. But then Jesus begins to expound on this in verse verses 35 when he says, "I am the bread. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty." So we see this this paradigm that Jesus is trying to build is that. The, the, those, sorry, in verse um, 26, those that, that are looking to him and are, are following him because they ate loaves and they are filled are actually those who are willing to, to eat of him, to take his bread, to take his body, his blood, and for it to become one with them. So there's a, there's this deeper thing that's going on. He's saying, those that truly believe I am the one that's satisfied. They will be my, they will be one with me. They will be my followers. They will be my true disciples. But if you are unwilling to eat of me, if you're unwilling to believe on me to be the source of your life, to be the, to be the truth, then you will, you will have no part of me. So the, um, let's look down um, after verse 58. He says this, you know, he said those statements. I am the, I am the, body, eat my flesh, drink my blood. For a Jewish person, this would have messed them up completely because they weren't even supposed to touch bodies, dead bodies, or anything of that nature. So to say I want to I want to eat somebody's flesh is like it, it, it would it would totally it would totally turn everybody away for him to say these statements. And that's exactly what happens. Um, in in verse 60 it says, on hearing this, many of the disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? You know, who can accept it? Eating his, his flesh, drinking his blood. And Jesus replies to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, and who would betray him? He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Then in verse 66, From that time on, many of his disciples 
turn back and no longer follow him. He this to even the twelve, the twelve that he had called to be closest to him. He says, you, do you want to leave me too? Do you? I love how he has a double emphasis on that. Do you not want to leave me too? Do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. So, we see this contrast between two different groups of people. A group of people that followed after Jesus because of the signs and the miraculous things that they saw. This is the, the comparison Jesus is making through this whole passage. There's a group of people that would go after Jesus because of the signs and the miracles that Jesus did. And, and we may see in a modern in a modern culture, these are, maybe we would say, maybe the, the bless me church culture where they, they have received, they've seen God do miracles and they're really excited about that. They, they saw God provide miraculous provision and they're excited about that and they, they serve God, um, some people would say they serve God for his hands and not for who he is. They serve God because he's able to do these things. And there's a contrast that Jesus is making here between those people that had just seen this crazy miracle, feeding 5,000 people, and those that, that knew him and, and were willing to believe on him, were willing to receive him and eat, eat basically as much as what, to eat the words that he was saying, to eat the fact that he was the Son of God. He was who he said he was. And this is, this is so key when Peter replies to him, do you want to leave too? He says, no, for you have the words of life. There's nobody else that has the words of life. And so as I was, as I was thinking about this whole, this whole year, um, about learning to trust, learning to trust the Father, learning to trust Jesus with, with everything, even, even the like when I went to Nick Robbie to, to to know the thoughts that were going through my mind, like I knew like not that somehow the the fact that the, the test proved that Rachel's blood was low means that her blood was already low, you know, when I left. Like it wasn't something that just happened automatically. So um, yeah, but in in my mind I was like, oh if they find out I mean like she could be close to death. Like not that if you now all of a sudden like if you in my head, but the not that the, the test now that she had the test approved, like now it's all in the open that she's already you know close to close to dying. So, but if I didn't know that fact, then I then I was okay with it. I know I got some things to work out in my mind, but anyway, um, <laughs> but um, but God was when God told me, Andrew, do you trust me? I in that moment I have to I had to make a decision. Andrew, do a do I trust God because of the, the miracles and the signs and the wonders, because of what he has done? Because he's done really awesome things. I could tell more stories in the past that I, would, I could think back and say, okay, yeah, I know that. Or do I trust him because I know who he is? Who he is? His essence. He is, he is the bread of life. He is the one that satisfies. He is the one that is in control. He is the one that is, that is sovereign. Do I believe the truth about him? And this is what Jesus, Jesus said in verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. And that's our challenge. Our challenge is not, are we going to believe on him because of all the good things he has done, which he has done good things, but the good things that he has done point to a greater fact. The greater fact is the good things that he has done points to who he is. And who he is, the loving, caring father, who he is, the is a, is a miracle worker, who he is is a healer, who he is is one that is sovereign, who he is, he is, a, he is the king, who he is, he's the one that's in control, who he is, he's the bread of life that nothing else can satisfy me, nothing else can satisfy me like Jesus can. And, and uh, the, to, to go back to this comparison, we can be in this group that sees all the wonderful things of God and, and, and there's nothing wrong with them. It's good. There's, there are good things about it. But if our belief stays on his good works, then we never get to know who he is. And the invitation that Jesus was making to them when he said, come eat my flesh and drink my blood, the invitation to him was, come know me. 
come to me. And, and throughout this year, that has been his challenge to me. Andrew, come know me. Come know that the things that you have heard in, in the word, things, the sermons, the, I, you know, I've heard tons of sermons, even though I'm maybe one of the younger in the room. I, I mean, I've heard sermons and sermons, and I know there's a lot of information that I know, but he's been challenging this here. Andrew, do you, do you really believe? Is it here? Do you believe me? Do you believe that I'm the one that's been killed? Do you believe me that I'm the one that satisfies you, Andrew? And to the extent that I have been willing to say, yes, God, I believe, even in my circumstances, when everything doesn't look like it, um, like it's true about you, I believe you. I believe you. I'm willing to eat your blood, to drink your blood, to drink your blood, to eat your flesh, to commune with you, Jesus, to know you, because I believe you. So that's the challenge that I believe God is placing at our, our, our feet today, is he's asking us, do you believe? Do you believe what I say is true? Do you believe who I am? Not just for what I've done, but who I am. So let's uh, bow our heads and pray this morning. Father, I thank you that you have, you have the words of truth. You have the words of Father, today we just confess that sometimes uh, it's hard to believe. Sometimes the enemy uh, is so good at lying to us. He's so good at trying to convince us that, what you, that who you are uh, is, is opposite of what you have said you are. But Father, today I want to make a decision believe you, to believe the truth. Because you have the words of eternal life. You have the bread that satisfies my deepest desires. It's you and you alone. Nothing else can satisfy me. Nothing else can calm my storms. Nothing else can bring redemption. Nothing else can be my provision. No boss, no job, no nothing can provide for me the way you do, my Heavenly Father. And no one else can heal me like you can. Jesus, your words, they heal my inmost being. They heal my emotions. They heal my anger. They heal, heal my fear. They heal my, heal my worry and my anxiety. It's only you that can do that. There's nothing else. There's no substance. There's no person. There's no doctor. There's no therapy. Nothing else can heal me like you do, Jesus. You are the healer. King Jesus, you are in control. And sometimes I'm totally convinced that I'm in control, that I can, I can work things out better for myself, that I can, I can manipulate the situation out for my good, that, that I somehow can control and, and can, can do the work better. But Jesus, King Jesus, you have proven that you are king, that you are sovereign over all things, that you are in control. You have said this in your word. So Father, my prayer today that you would help me believe. Jesus, that's, that's the work that you said that we have to do. You've called us to do no other work but to believe. So Jesus, help my heart believe. Help our heart believe that what you say is true, that you are the only one for us. This morning, I want to take time and pray with you. Maybe Maybe this morning there's certain circumstances that are going on around you that, that you are having a hard time believing the truth about God, the truth that He wants for your situation. And you say, you would say this morning, Andy, would you would you stand with me? Would you pray with me that that, that my heart would believe the truth about God, that this situation I'm facing, that, that this problem is not impossible, that that maybe even this addiction that I have is is that it that Jesus can actually satisfy me better than this addiction that I have, that I just, I just want to believe more on the truth. If that's you this morning, I would invite you to come forward. And then, then also, if, if there's even some kind of physical healing that you need or some emotional healing that you need, and you just want somebody to, to pray with you this morning and agree with you that, that the healer, the, 
the King Jesus, that he would make himself known in, in your physical body or in your, um, in your emotions, then I, w I would love to invite you to come forward. I can, uh, I'll pray with you too. And stand in the gap and say, God, help us believe the truth about you. So if that's you this morning, if you need help just believe in the truth, I want to invite you forward so we can pray.